Chapter 14 The walls of the ruined mansion were scorched black from the fire that had destroyed it. There was still a foul smell in the air, although it had been years since the blaze. It felt like a dark, forbidding place, even to a night creature like Larton. It didn't surprise him that the monster, the vampire, had picked this spot for its base. They each took a stake from the bag. Wester kept the hammer. He gave Larton a cross and stuck the holy water in a pocket. He left the saw and garlic in the bag outside the ruins, telling Larton that they could return for those later if they were successful. The scared boys slowly picked their way through the debris, saying nothing, studying each new room or corridor at length before entering. The roof and upper floors had fallen in, but lots of floorboards and tiles remained in certain sections, casting scores of shadows. There were many places for a sun-fearing killer to hide. If Larton had been by himself, he would have waited until midday when the sun was at its strongest and proceeded at a snail's pace, making as little noise as possible. But Wester was in a hurry to wreak revenge. He couldn't bear to stand still. He might go mad if he did. Larton spotted the opening to the cellar. It had been half covered by several planks. He considered saying nothing to Wester. It might be for the best if the boy never saw it, if he explored the rest of the ruins and came to the conclusion that the beast wasn't here. They could go home and that would be the end of it. But Larton had come to uncover the truth not engage in an act of deception. He was here to help Wester, not slowly direct him out of danger's way. The orphan deserved his shot at revenge, so Lighton tugged Wester's sleeve and pointed. Wester's cheeks paled. For a moment he looked like he might bolt for safety. Then he steeled himself, nodded grimly, led the way to the steps and pushed some of the planks aside. They descended in silence and soon found themselves in a small cellar that had probably been used to store food and wine in the past. It was dark, but not pitch black. Light filtered through the entrance behind them, and also from the cracks in the ceiling. There was something lying by the wall to their right, in the darkest part of the room. It was the shape of a human, covered by thick blankets. Wester started forward, but Lighton stopped him. Before advancing, he made a slow turn, studying the walls and ceiling. He had been taken by surprise once in a place like this. He wasn't about to be caught out twice. Having checked for an ambush, Lighton moved ahead of Wester and edged to one side, leaving clear the most direct route to the body. He would give Wester the first strike. If the boy failed, Lighton would leap to his aid. He'd have been happier taking the lead. After his years with Seba, he was sharper than any human his age. But this was Wester's battle, not his. As Wester closed in, Lighton spotted a problem. Wester would have to pull back the blankets before striking in order to pinpoint the beast's heart. That would give the monster a chance to defend itself. Lighton slid in front of Wester. The boy hissed and raised the hammer and stake. He'd been so focused on what he had to do that for a moment he didn't realise it was Lighton who'd stepped in his way. Then his vision cleared and he relaxed slightly. Lighton pointed at the blankets, then at himself, and made a gesture to show that he would pull them back. Wester nodded. Lighton made another gesture, trying to encourage Wester to hammer the stake home quickly. Again, Wester nodded, but he looked irritated now. Did Lighton think he planned to stand around and whistle a few verses of a song before he struck? They came within touching distance of the blankets. Lighton's hands were shaking, but he didn't mind. Only a fool wouldn't be scared in a situation like this. He bent softly. He wanted to flex his fingers, but he was afraid his knuckles might make a cracking sound and alert the sleeping monster. Lighton glanced up at Wester. The boy looked sick, but he wiped sweat from his brow, then positioned the stake over the area where he assumed the killer's heart would be. He lifted the hammer. Like Lighton, he was shaken, but he had a firm grip on his weapons. Lighton grabbed the coarse, hairy fabric of the blankets and prepared to pull. But before he could, the blankets were tugged sharply by the shape beneath. Caught off guard, Lighton was jerked sideways into Wester, knocking him over. As both boys shrieked, the killer of Wester's family sprang to its feet and sneered at the amateur assassins. Even in the darkness of the cellar, Lighton could see that this was no vampire and for the small mercy he gave thanks. At least Seba had not lied to him. The creature's skin was a gloomy purple colour, and its hair, eyes, lips and fingernails were red. It had the form of a man and dressed like one, but it was clearly no human. Wester scrambled to his feet and swung his stake wildly. The purple-skinned beast chopped at the boy's arm. Lighton heard bone snap, and then Wester fell, screaming with pain. His stake dropped from his now useless fingers and rolled away. The red-haired thing glanced at Lighton and frowned when it saw his orange hair. It was momentarily thrown, not sure what to make of its strange assailant. Lighton seized the moment of indecision and threw his stake at the monster. The beast ducked and Lighton lunged. He 
he grabbed Wester's stake and came to his feet a safe distance from their opponent. As the purplish creature straightened and studied its foe, Lighten fixed on the area around him, not on the monstrous man. He stood motionless, stake by his side, trying not to breathe. Wester pushed himself off the floor and lashed out with his hammer. The killer caught it and calmly snapped off the head. As Wester stared despairingly at the piece of wood in his hand, the monster clubbed him over the head and he slumped. It was impossible to tell if he was unconscious or dead, and Lighten had no time to worry about it. The monster shifted away from Lighten as it struck Wester. Lighten was tempted to break for the stairs, but that was what the beast wanted. If he turned his back on the purple skin killer, he was finished for sure. So he held his ground, moving as little as possible, not blinking. The monster faced Lighten and narrowed its eyes, wary of this young but clearly far from foolish foe. The creature took a step forward, then smiled thinly and pounced, faster than a human eye could follow, but Lighten had been trained to register the blur of a vampire. Seba had fainted at him on countless occasions, to sharpen his sense and teach him how to defend himself against an enemy quicker than he was. As the killer lunged, Lighten brought up the stake, judging it finally, trying to hit the spot where Seba would appear if this was just another test. To his delight, he struck flesh and the monster wheeled away, clutching its left arm. Lighten had hoped to do more than just wound the creature, but at least this proved he had a chance. Adjusting his stance, he again focused on the area around him and waited for his opponent to make a second pass, but the beast didn't move. It was smiling broadly, almost smirking. Licking a finger, it ran spit over the shallow cut on its arm, and the wound began to close. Seba's spit had the same healing properties. As far as Lighten knew, that was only common to vampires. Confusion set in. Was this bizarre monster one of the clan? As Lighten was trying to decide the nature of his foe, the killer spoke. You are a vampire's assistant. I could smell your master's scent, but I wanted to see you in action to be certain. Hmm? The creature had an unfamiliar accent and an odd way of talking. What are you? Lighten snarled, not lowering his guard. The beast frowned. Your master has not told you about the vampanese? Lighten recalled Seba's meeting with Pariscar. Seba had mentioned something then about vampanese. Lighten had filed the nugget away to investigate the matter at some other time. It seemed that the time was now. You have the speed and spit of a vampire, Lighten said, and you drink blood, but you're not a vampire, are you? I'd rather be a dog than a vampire. I have no time for those of the clan. He spat out the word as if it was a curse. I am of a purer breed. Vampires always drain our victims. We don't leech off them like your master. You kill every time you feed? Lighten gasped. It's the proper way, the vampires sniffed. Vampires fed like us too, before they grew soft. We don't feed often, there's no need when you drink deeply. But when we do, we sup until we hit the bottom of the well, thus taking a shade of the victim's soul and honouring them. What are you talking about? Lighten asked. The vampires tuttered. Your master has been lax. He should have told you that if a vampire drains a person dry, the vampire absorbs that person's memories, keeping part of their soul alive. We vampires kill every time we feed, but those we target live on inside us for decades or centuries to come. You think that makes it acceptable? Lighten snarled. Yes, the vampires said. Vampires did too, before they grew soft. Wester groaned and twitched. The vampires squinted at the unconscious boy. He is one of the flax. I thought I'd killed them all. Generous of him to come to me like this. It would have been embarrassing if I'd left with the job half done. Hmm? As the killer stepped towards Wester, Lighten slid between them. Leave him alone. You're his friend? The vampires asked. No, Lighten said. I only met him for the first time today. Then this is not your business, the killer snapped. You're new to this, wet behind the ears, so I'm willing to overlook your interference. Vampires don't meddle with our affairs, and we don't mess with theirs. I have the right to kill you for attacking me, but I'm prepared to let you leave. You can chalk it down to experience, hmm? But the human dies. His father killed a friend of mine. Wester had nothing to do with that, Lighten said, holding his ground. The vampire shrugged. In our world, the sins of the father are the sins of the sons, and the wife, and the daughters too. Last chance. Get out of my way. No, Lighten said firmly. If you want to kill Wester, you'll have to kill me first. The purple-skinned man laughed. So be it. The vampires was even faster this time. 
Lighten managed to strike, but his arm was slapped aside and a hard palm banged into his chest. He flew across the room and slammed into a wall. Stars flashed before his eyes, but he blinked them away and tried to haul himself to his feet. The Vampanese, having followed, stopped him with a soft shove to his head. As Lighten collapsed, defeated, the Vampanese squatted beside him. Abandon the boy, he whispered. If you renounce him, I'll spare you. Yes, I will. Why waste your life on a worthless human that you barely know? I gave him my word that I would help, Lighten gasped. But you cannot save him, the Vampanese reasoned. Then I'll die with him. I gave my word. The Vampanese's blazing red eyes were terrifying, but Lighten never lowered his gaze or flinched. Sipa had taught him to face up to the things that he was afraid of. The Vampanese laid a jagged fingernail on the flesh of Lighten's throat. Lighten wanted to close his eyes and pray, but didn't. Instead, he stared at his murderer, determined to die looking squarely at his executioner rather than cowering away from him. The nail dug into Lighten's flesh, and he tensed, sure that this was the end. But then the Vampanese withdrew his finger. Wiping blood on his trouser leg, he stood up and smiled tightly at the confused boy. You will make a true vampire, he said with grudging respect. You'd fare better as a Vampanese. Our way would suit a fiery pup like you. Yes, it would. But you've chosen your master, and I won't ask you to break your pledge to him. But if you ever tire of the confines of the clan, seek me out. The Vampanese cracked his knuckles, then spat at the unconscious Wester, the same way that Lyden had spat at the feet of the priest. I shouldn't have to leave, but if I don't, he'll come after me again, and you'll have to help him since you've given your word, and I wouldn't be able to pardon you a second time. Anyway, it's been a while since I ran beneath the full sun. The sunburn would be good for me. We should all suffer every once in a while. Hmm? The purple chicken creature walked to the steps, where he paused and looked back at the startled blind Crepsy. I won't ask for your master's name, just as I have not requested yours, but I am not afraid to give you mine. When he asked... Tell your master that Merlot held your life in his hands and chose to be merciful. Let him and his clan brood on that the next time they're belittling the good name of the Vampanese in the wretched halls of Vampire Mountain. With a sneer, Merlot bounded up the steps and smashed aside the planks at the top. He raced out of the wreck and across the fields, already wincing from the burning heat of the sun, looking for somewhere new to hole up and hide until night fell and the world was his.